thank you very much, Corey. Uh, thank you, Paul, for having me back. That's always a sign that I did a reasonably good job last year with my speech that I got asked to come back. That's always good. So if I don't get inv invited back next year, I'll know this this speech really stunk. Um, thank you for the to the Institute for Faith and Freedom for having me. And thank you to Brenda as well, uh, and of course Paul Kenger. And thank you to all of you for coming today. Um, and I, you know, looking over the list of um, of uh, talks, I thought that mine appeared to be a bit of an outlier because um, my talk is more about the row aspect of the abortion debate and the role of the Supreme Court. But I think it's a good, uh, in any, any conversation that we're having about abortion in America, I don't think that we can have one without considering the role of the Supreme Court in our body politic. And I think in light of the, uh, I, I don't think I'm, um, I'm going to be going against the grain here by saying that I think that Roe versus Wade was a disgracefully decided opinion. I'm glad that it was repealed last year, but I think I, I think we need to think about the fact that um, such an opinion could be promulgated and could be the rule of law for 50 some odd years. And what does that say about our republic? What does it say about our republic that um, seven unelected lawyers? Um, who are all dead could impose such a such a decision on the rest of us, um, affecting so many millions of lives, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And that that's going to lead me inevitably to talk about the idea of judicial review. So I have three items for you to consider today: the idea, first of all, the idea of judicial review, the very basis on upon which Roe was decided, is not obviously constitutional. It is not. It is arguably constitutional. But it's not obviously so. And indeed, the founders, the founding fathers themselves, disagreed about the role of the court in public life. Number two, I think that even if we consider it to be constitutional, it is in tension with the spirit and aims and goals of the Constitution itself and the nature of Republican government. Number three, while judicial review has often been uncontroversial, it has also been quite good for our body politic. Too often the court has abused the power of judicial review to act as a political actor above our political system, to act as a faction, and that it did this in Roe, but it is certainly not the first time it has done it, and I don't think it will be the last. So that's my agenda today. So. The United, as we all know today, right, we all know this, the, the United States Supreme Court wields sweeping powers. We know that. But you would never know it just from Article 3 of the Constitution, the article on the judiciary. It runs only 377 words long. That is less than one-fifth the length of Article 1 on Congress. Article 3 establishes the Supreme Court, outlines a process for choosing judges, delimits the boundaries between direct and appellate, dire uh, appellate jurisdiction, spends about a third of its time defining treason. That's about it. Congress decides how many lower courts there shall be, how they'll be organized, and even how many justices sit on the Supreme Court. If Congress wanted to tomorrow, they could make all of us members of the Supreme Court. They could put 330 million people on the Supreme Court, or they could just have one person. Now, it was clear to the Founding Fathers when they convened in Philadelphia in 1787 that federal courts were necessary. Under the Articles of Confederation, state courts resolved disputes over the laws of Congress, which was not good. If the federal government was going to wield power effectively, it had to have a federal court system. But many Americans were suspicious of the judicial branch. They had bad memories from the lead up to the revolution where George III abused the judicial branch to basically um, oppress his political opponents. And so uh, while they recognized there had to be a judiciary, they thought that the less said about it, the better. And as a compromise, they let Congress figure out the details. And by the way, this speaks to, you've probably heard the phrase that the branches of our government are co-equal. It's not true. Branches of our government are not co-equal. They are coordinate. They are coordinate. The judicial branch is not co-equal to Congress because the judicial branch in large measure is a creation of the Congress. In Federalist 78, Alexander Hamilton sought to allay, alleviate concerns that the judiciary would become tyrannical. 
Having neither force nor will, as Hamilton put it, the court had to depend on the other branches to effectuate its rulings. It needed the Congress to appropriate the money. It needed the president to actually enforce its judgments. Importantly, the framers gave the Supreme Court the power to adjudicate, quote, all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority. On one reading, the case or controversies clause that it's become known is a straightforward and uncontroversial power. The courts are supposed to resolve disputes arising under the law. This is what courts do. The Constitution is the highest law, so naturally it follows that the courts have to follow the Constitution. But looking more closely at the phrasing, several important questions emerge. And again, there were no clear answers among the framers themselves to these questions. What happens if a law contradicts the Constitution? Can the court strike it down? What happens if the Constitution is unclear? Can the court enforce its own interpretation? If it can, far from being outside the political process, the court suddenly appears not just in the political process, but superior to the political process. Is that what the framers meant? Of course, what I'm talking about here again is the power of judicial review or the idea that the court has the unique privilege of holding the other branches accountable to its interpretation of the Constitution. Some of the framers were comfortable with this. Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 78 boldly inferred from the case or controversies clause that the Constitution gives the court the power to strike down unconstitutional laws. It cannot, Hamilton asserted, be, quote, the natural presumption that the legislative body should be the judge of its own powers. Instead, Hamilton said, it's, quote, far more rational, end quote, to suppose that the task would devolve on the court, what he called an intermediate body between the people and the legislature protecting the former from the latter. But note carefully, let's pause here and think carefully about what Hamilton is suggesting, bearing in mind that Hamilton was an excellent polemicist arguably the best of his age. He had a real talent, perhaps his greatest talent, was to make a controversial opinion seem quite commonplace, or to make a common sense objection seem ridiculous, or even in some cases, unpatriotic. What did Hamilton say exactly? He said the court is to sit between, as an intermediate body, the people and the legislature. But there is already an intermediate body, or maybe better put, an intermediate institution between the people and the legislature, those are elections. What Hamilton was really saying is that sometimes the people acting through the process of elections lack the capacity to identify and pu punish legislators who pursue injustice or themselves prefer injustice. That's quite an elitist sentiment, much more so than you might be led to believe that Hamilton would hold based solely on a recent Broadway musical. But in fact, Hamilton had great faith in what he might call a natural aristocracy. Now, by that, he didn't mean titles of nobility passed down as a patrimony from father to son, as was the case in the kingdoms of Europe. Instead, he believed there were those who, by virtue of natural, or natural endowment, possessed extraordinary qualities. He believed that all men and women were governed by their passions, but that some were governed by nobler passions, the noblest being the desire to be remembered well by history. And for Hamilton, the great elite, the great model of the natural aristocracy was George Washington. And the task of us mere mortals in a republic was to elevate those individuals to power and let them do the work. This kind of elitism did not sit well with the anti-federalist critics of the Constitution. Melanchthon Smith, for instance, was a New York politician who wrote a series of very, very important, brilliant essays opposing the Constitution under the pseudonym of Brutus. Many of his warnings about the Constitution turned out to be true. He argued that Article Three of the Constitution gave the court a, what he called a latitude of explanation that it would use to tip the balance in favor of the federal government over the states. He said, quote, in proportion as the former enlarge the exercise of their powers, will that of the latter be restricted. Interestingly, James Madison, known as the father of the Constitution, and Madison's co-author of the Federalist Papers, his main co-author, 
His views on the court were probably closer to the Melanchthon Smiths than to Hamilton's. Like Hamilton, Madison was certainly dubious about the capacity of the people at large to secure justice and promote the general welfare. But he was more skeptical, he was just as skeptical about the wisdom, the virtue, and patriotism of the elites. He didn't have nearly as much faith in them as Alexander Hamilton did. In truth, he really trusted nobody. And his vision of the Constitution was therefore one in which no group wielded ultimate power because no group could wield it responsibly. That was his preference for matters of mundane policy as well as weightier constitutional disputes. Madison's Federalist 51 actually stands in stark contrast to Hamilton's Federalist 78. Hamilton in Federalist 78 makes the argument that final authority of the meaning of the Constitution should rest with the courts, but in Federalist 51, Madison argues that the best way to settle arguments over the proper scope of constitutional power was to set the branches against each other, give each of them the power to defend itself, and the constitutional equilibrium could be maintained. His Virginia plan, Madison's Virginia plan, which he presented at the Constitutional Convention, it was sort of his rough draft, embodied this notion of constitutional arbitration through politics because he included within it a council of revision. This council would have combined the president and select members of the courts to review congressional laws and determine whether or not they pass constitutional muster. Madison provided for the possibility of a legislative override of the council's judgments as well. So, constitutional questions for Madison would be resolved in the same way that legislative compromises are reached, through a well-organized political process that promotes give and take, where nobody dominates everybody else, and the ultimate goal is one of consensus. Now, the framers obviously discarded Madison's Council of Revision and indeed didn't really say anything in the Constitution about how to arbitrate disputes arising under it. But Madison left Philadelphia still believing that politics was the proper way to resolve disputes. In 1789, as the House was debating, the House of Representatives was debating whether or not the President would have the power to fire the Secretary gives the president the power to nominate the Secretary of State with the advice and consent of the Senate. doesn't say anything about whether or not he can fire him. So there was a debate in Congress about this. Madison believed the president should have the power to fire him alone, exclusively. And this was his argument about the question of, well, who gets to make, who gets to make this determination? Who gets to decide what the Constitution actually says? And this is what Madison offered. He said, nothing has yet been offered to invalidate the doctrine that the meaning of the Constitution may as well be ascertained by the legislative as by the judicial authority. When a question is, emerges as it does in this bill, and much seems to depend on it, I should conceive it highly proper to make a legislative construction. In 1798, in opposition to the Alien and Sedition Acts, which had criminalized political speech against the government, Madison author authored the Virginia Res Resolutions, which opposed the, the, the Alien and Sedition Acts and called on the states to interpose themselves. That was the phrase he used, interpose, between the people and this noxious act of federal repression. A couple years later, expanding on what exactly he was getting at, Madison rejected the idea that the judiciary had the sole authority to determine the Constitution's meaning. He wrote, quote, there may be instances of usurped power which the forms of the Constitution would never draw within the control of the Judicial Repart Department. Instead, quote, the decisions of the other departments could be equally authoritative and final with the decisions of the courts, end quote. Even in retirement, Madison still rejected the idea that the judiciary alone should give meaning to the Constitution and argued instead that legitimacy sprang from what he called, quote, the uniform sanction of successive legislative, legislative bodies through a period of years and under the varied ascendancy of parties, end quote. In other words, political process that produces public consensus. Madison's vision of constitutionalism, in my judgment, is closer to the philosophy of the Constitution, the underlying philosophy of the Constitution, than, than Hamilton's. The Constitution, as an instrument of government, seeks to resolve social, economic, and political disputes without empowering any single group as a hegemon or dominant actor.
Instead of giving one group or institution the power of the umpire, the Constitution entrusted to the political process itself, setting up the rules of the game so that no group can get everything that it wants. That creates a process in which different factions of society have to negotiate with each other. As each angles for its own advantage, it blocks the most egregious demands of the other, and over time, something approaching a common interest emerges. As different factions converge upon a policy that may not be their first choice, but one that they can all live with. And I agree with Madison that the constitutional approach is one that involves not just questions of public policy, but the meaning and scope of constitutional power itself. The goal, ultimately, is not a simply a majoritarian system in which half plus one rules absolutely over half minus one, but a consensus-based system in which the actions of the government reflect the views and values of a large, broad, and durable majority of the body politic. Now, Madison's vision of the role of the court ultimately lost, as we know, to the Hamiltonian view. That wasn't thanks to Hamilton himself, but to the work of Chief Justice John Marshall whose landmark Marbury versus Madison ruling in 1804 established for the court a broad scope of authority. And the circumstances of that case were hardly propitious for Marshall. He was a member of the Federalist Party, which emerged in the 1790s as a strong advocate for federal power and a tight alliance with Great Britain. After Thomas Jefferson, who was in the opposing party, after Jefferson won in 1800, the political appeal of federalism declined rapidly. Recognizing that they had lost the support of the people, the Federalists dominated Congress in 1801, tried to establish a permanent foothold in the courts. They did so by passing the Judiciary Act of 1801, which greatly expanded the number of judges. President Adams, who had lost the election to Jefferson, worked literally until the last night of his administration to get as many of his allies onto the courts as possible. When Jefferson took power and Madison as his Secretary of State, the two of them engaged in a bit, a bit of political hardball themselves. Not only did they repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801, they also refused to deliver the commissions that Adams had left behind. So you can imagine a scenario in which uh, Adams nominates somebody for a judicial position, the Senate confirms it, Adams signs the commission, but he leaves office before he can deliver it. So you can imagine a situation in which Thomas Jefferson comes into the White House on day one with a big stack of commissions. Rather than deliver them to people, he just tosses them in the trash, right? That's political hardball in 1801 for you, right? One of the people who did not get his commission was William Marbury, who was nominated by Adams and confirmed by the Senate to be a justice of the peace in Washington, DC. All Marbury needed was his commission to certify his position on the court. But Madison, in his official capacity as Secretary of State, refused to hand it over, so Marbury sued. Following the procedures under the Judiciary Act of 1789, the case went directly to the Supreme Court. Now, Marshall, John Marshall, the Chief Justice, was in a political bind. Remember, he's a Federalist. He was just recently appointed by the court by, by John Adams, the Federalist Party's in in decline, the Republicans, the Jeffersonians are in ascendancy. Clearly, at least at first blush, Marbury is correct on the merits. Right? He had been nominated by Adams. He had been confirmed by the Senate. His commission had been signed. It was simply a matter of delivering the paperwork to duly appointed ju a justice of the peace. But ruling for Madison, ruling for Marbury, what would happen? Madison would just ignore the ruling, and the court would look weak. On the other hand, ruling for Madison would look like an act of cowardice and probably yield the same result. But it turned out, however, that Marshall was something of a Harry Houdini. He slipped free of his constraints and offered one of the most ingenious rulings in court history, and indeed one of the most brilliant political maneuvers in the entire history of the United States of America. He ruled for Madison, but it was the reasoning that mattered. Marshall argued that Marbury had no standing to take his case directly to the Supreme Court. Article 3 of the Constitution enumerates the types of cases in which the court has original jurisdiction, where it's the first court to hear a case. Marbury's was not one of them, so therefore, the Judiciary Act of 1789 was in part unconstitutional. Marshall's judgment was a triumph for Hamilton's vision as laid out in Federalist 78. From a Madisonian standpoint, the notion of striking down the Judiciary Act of 1789 was problematic. 
The law by that point was 15 years old and had been uncontroversial. Neither political side, neither the Jeffersonian Republicans or the Federalists had any problems with it. In other words, the political process had yielded a clear consensus on its legitimacy. But from Hamilton's viewpoint, as expressed in Federalist 78, the Judiciary Act was still fair game. It was the court's responsibility to the National Charter that the violation had happened more than a decade ago simply did not matter. Marshall's ruling was a brilliant political maneuver that he managed to do so in a moment when the Federalists were fading into political obscurity makes it all the more remarkable. And then having established judicial review, Marshall refused to tempt fate again with subsequent Republican administrations. Instead, he turned his attention to the states, used judicial review to secure the federal government's supremacy over the state governments. By the end of his tenure, Marshall had presided over a twofold judicial revolution. He established a broad understanding of federal power, minimized the ways the states might interfere. But he also elevated the court into the final arbiter of constitutional questions. Judicial review implies, if not outright judicial supremacy, then a certain amount of finality. The court claims the power to reject any law if a simple majority of the justices decides it violates their interpretation of the Constitution. No other branch of our government operates so freely of the others. In response to an adverse court ruling, the rest of the government has only three options, all of which are extraordinary. It can challenge the court's prerogative of judicial review, maybe by stoking a constitutional crisis, maybe through rhetoric, but maybe changing the nature of the court. It can amend the Constitution, or it can change the composition of the court. These are all extraordinary in this sense. They all require sustained coordination among the other branches of government to undo the court's rulings. That makes it unique because in the normal political process, the president, the House, the Senate, each of them alone can check the designs of the others. If the Senate wants to do something and the House doesn't want to do it, it doesn't get done. Right? If the president wants to do something that's not already been authorized by the law and the House, and the, and the House doesn't want to do it, it doesn't get done. Right? If the court wants to do something to that, for that to be stopped, the House, the Senate, and the president must all coordinate. No other branch wields the authority to single-handedly impose its dictates on the rest of the government, as the Supreme Court does. This is why, as Justice Joseph Story said, the only check upon our own exercise of power is our own sense of self-restraint. So when you read Federalist 51 and talk about checks and balances, it doesn't apply to the modern court. For Hamiltonian, this is nothing too much to worry about. The process of nomination and confirmation to the court will hopefully elevate the best and the brightest. And such individuals of preeminence should have a broader scope of activity to interpret the law for the good of the rest of us. Their self-restraint, the self-restraint self -restraint of the natural aristocracy is for a Hamiltonian a sufficient barrier. But from a Madisonian perspective, the court's separation from politics means that it is not bound by the constitutional structures that impose consensus on the lawmaking process. In most cases, sure, the court can be a dispassionate arbiter for justice because the interests and beliefs and preferences of the justices are not ensnared in the facts of the case. But when the court takes on cases that have broader social implications, Madison would argue that it is much more difficult for judges to put aside their own partiality. The court, in other words, will be tempted to act like a faction and a hegemonic one at that for it is essentially unchecked by the other forces in the government. Now, throughout the remainder of Marshall's tenure, this was mostly an academic question. Madison personally disliked the way Marshall consistently read Hamilton's views of the Constitution into the founding, in, 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 through his uh, rulings, but it wasn't speaks to the brilliance of Marshall. The first uh, and most regrettable example of the abuse of judicial review happened within a generation of Marshall's passing. And that's the case of um, Dred Scott v. Sanford. 
By 1857, the slavery controversy was burning hot in American politics, and that was the context in which Chief Justice Roger Taney issued his ruling. Dred Scott was an enslaved man who had spent more than a decade in the free territories of the present-day Midwest, and it was on that basis that he sued for his freedom. Writing for a 7-2 to majority, Justice Roger Taney argued that Scott's time in the North in the Free Territory of the North was irrelevant. He was, had been the property of his master, and the Fifth Amendment prohibits the seizure of property without due process of law. That had never happened, so Scott was still enslaved. Taney's ruling was contemptible. The case made for bad law, bad history, bad politics. It was pure, unadulterated factionalism. Tawney and the Southerners on the court strained for a way to accomplish for their region what they no longer could through the political process. In his first inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln flatly rejected the authority of the court to make this kind of ruling, while admitting that the court court decisions, quote, must be binding in any case upon the parties to a suit as to the object of the suit, end quote, he thought it absurd that, quote, vital questions affecting the whole people be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court. In such a society, quote, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal, end quote. Lincoln's professed judicial minimalism was hardly the stuff of Alexander Hamilton and John Marshall, but more of Madison. But what other choice did Lincoln have? If the court was going to use its power so irresponsibly, he was obliged to deny them the future opportunities to do so. Obviously, Dred Scott's an extreme case. It's the worst uh, d decision in the history of the Supreme Court, which is really saying something, because there have been some really bad decisions rendered by uh, the high court. Dred Scott's the worst, but nevertheless it highlights the potential dangers of judicial review and the problem the political branches have when it is used. It relies on little more than the virtue of the justices to prevent them from reading their policy preferences into the law. Marshall, John Marshall possessed that kind of virtue, which enabled him to build for the court a reputation as a reliable steward of the constitutional order. But Robert used the powers bequeathed by Marshall to take one side over another in a fractious debate of extreme importance. That left the political branches with few options but to challenge the very legitimacy of Marshall's legacy, as Lincoln was forced to in his inaugural address. During the Civil War, the court slunk into the background, chastened by the events that unfolded after Dred Scott, but within, it, within a generation it was back once more using the law to impose a particular worldview on the nation. This time, it wasn't the interests of the southern slaveocracy, but those of industrial capitalists, which the court would vigorously defend for another 80 years. The United States had entered the Industrial Revolution in the early decades of the 19th century, and by the time of the Civil War, the North had developed a fast-growing industrial sector. The war gave an incredible spur to this. Rapid industrialization certainly increased the wealth of the nation, but it created a whole host of problems. Farmers were at the mercy of the railroads that owned the lines on which their crops were transported to work market. Workers were forced to labor for long hours in dangerous conditions for little pay. Women and children were likewise drawn into the workforce in dangerous jobs. Meanwhile, the benefits of industrialization accumulated in the hands of a relatively few owners of large amounts of capital. To many, industrialization seemed inconsistent with the basic principles of a republic in which all people are created equal. In response, Americans increasingly agitated for government action to protect the welfare of workers and reduce the power of the rich in ways that we today take as commonsensical. Right? But it was against this public clamor that the court crafted for itself a new role. It staked a claim on behalf of the capitalists, arguing that the Constitution's protections for property rights required a laissez-faire approach to economic regulation. What's especially remarkable about this is how the court went about doing that. Used the 14th Amendment, which was enacted after the Civil War to prevent the states from depriving, quote, any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. 
the obvious intention of that was to protect the liberties of the freedmen. But as the court allowed the freedmen to suffer the fate that they suffered in the South, it reimagined the due process clause to protect business interests from any regulations that the court found to be too burdensome. How could this have happened again? Well, Madison once again provides the answer. The answer is factionalism. After the Civil War, Democrats and Republican elites became increasingly dependent on wealthy, wealthy businessmen to finance their electoral campaigns. Both parties were responsive to the interests of capital, and they accordingly stocked the courts with men who had once been corporate attorneys, who naturally saw the interests of the largest corporations in the United States of America as being consistent with the interests of the public good. They instinctively considered any challenge to laissez-faire as a gateway to communism. And since the power of judicial review placed the court mostly outside the political process, the only check on their actions was the justice's prudence. To be sure, the court was usually strategic in defense of laissez-faire, laying down sweeping doctrines that seemingly prevented any limitations on capital and then a couple years later finding a loophole. The rhyme and reason of this period is tough to discover on a case-by-case -case basis, but in totality, the court in the last half of the 19th century and up until the New Deal emerged as a kind of super legislature. Any regulation, be it federal, state, or local, was not secure until the court gave it the imprimatur of due process. It wasn't until the Great Depression struck in 1929 and the federal government took more seriously the question of regulating industrial capital that the court finally ran aground. In this case, it was against Franklin Roosevelt conservative majority on the Supreme Court struck down item after item of Roosevelt's New Deal. After his landslide election in 1936, the president decided enough was enough. By his reckoning, the people had given the New Deal its stamp of approval, and if the court continued to obstruct it, then he would overhaul the court. Well, sure enough, the court backed down. Right? But like Lincoln and before him, FDR rejected the ultimate authority of the court to rule over the political branches. So yes, the court back down. Subsequent uh, courts of the 40s and 50s were relatively quiet and the court generally deferred to the political branches for a time. Yet this deference would not last long. In due course, the old corporate attorneys were replaced with New Deal liberals who coalesced under the bold leadership of Chief Justice Earl Warren, ironically an appointee of a relatively conservative Republican by the name of Dwight Eisenhower. Between 1953 and 1969, the Warren Court struck down an astonishing number of laws, 23 on the federal level and 150 on the state level. Its interest was no longer so much in economics, but in culture, in, particularly, in particular the intersection of individual liberty and state action. Of course, the Warren Court did a lot of good during this time, Brown versus Board of uh, education overturned the old doctrine that allowed segregation in public facilities. It, the court also upheld the constitutionality of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, but it did so much more than this. From the late 1950s and into the 1960s, the court acted aggressively on behalf of civil liberties. Uh, the rights revolution of the Warren Court of the 1960s dramatically expanded the scope of free speech, prohibited prayer in public schools, expanded the rights of the accused, and limited the imposition of the death penalty. The court even promulgated a right to privacy, which, though not explicit in the Constitution, was nevertheless said to exist in its penumbras, or its shadows. Liberals cheered these developments as the court acting on the right side of history. But the court was once more picking signs in broader national disputes that under the logic of Madisonian constitutionalism should have been resolved through the political process. What secular liberals saw as the advocacy of core liberties, conservatives and Christians viewed the court as protecting pornographers at the expense of common decency, secularism at the expense of traditional values, criminals at the expense of public order, and the sexual revolution at the expense of the traditional family. And conservatives were not wrong. The court, as it had in the 19th century, was clearly on one side of this developing cultural divide. And despite its posture as a neutral arbiter of the law, it had again become a kind of super legislature, acting on behalf of one faction in society against the other. No law, federal or state, that dealt even directly with the interests of this court was safe until it gave its assent. This is the 
institutional, constitutional, or perhaps constitutional, because it's not, I don't think it really is, context in which Roe exists, and indeed in which this post-Roe era exists. It has often been said by conservatives that Roe is an unconstitutional ruling, in the sense that nothing in the Constitution conferred a right like what Roe had articulated. I agree with this, but I would add that Roe is actually doubly unconstitutional. In a republic, the sorts of in questions that inform Roe, the nature of individual rights, the questions of bodily autonomy, specifically whose bodily autonomy, and indeed the very nature of life itself, belong in the public sphere. These are exactly the sorts of issues that the framers would argue the political process is designed to adjudicate and to produce consensus. These are exactly the sorts of matters in which there should be no hegemonic institution, for such an institution is too prone to be captured by a faction. And while I celebrate certainly the overruling of overturning of Roe finally, I worry that the conservative movement made a bad strategic move half a century ago. In response to the excesses of the Warren and Burger courts, conservatives began to organize a sustained effort to reshape the judiciary. In fits and starts, Republican presidents have made good on their promise to voters to replace liberals with conservatives who would reorient the court. Right. Well, what's so bad about that? Well, arguably this. Conservatives at their core are institutionalists and, and, yes, even traditionalists. Old ways of doing things are to be given overwhelming precedence over novelty, especially old ways that have proven through time that they work. And above all, the constitutional order should be maintained. But judicial review, certainly when exercised in the way it was under Roe, is, in my opinion, an assault on the constitutional way that social, economic, and political disputes are to be reconciled. I would argue that Roe was so over the top and came after so much over the top lawmaking by the Warren and Burger courts that the constitutional option that the right should have pursued then was not to go underground and to reshape the court over the course of a generation, but rather to stand up to it directly as Lincoln did, as FDR did, to say to it, enough is enough. Your task is to resolve disputes between parties before you on a specific set of facts. It is not to offer sweeping moral judgments that properly in a republic belong to the people. We got rid of Roe finally, which is good but we've kept in place the underlying, my view, unconstitutional principle that undergirds Roe. And I worry, likewise, that the right now, one of the problems that I worry about now, even though I'm a conservative, I worry now that the right a conservative movement alone possesses the sweeping power of judicial review. I worry not because I'm a, a man of the left, I'm not. I worry because I'm a Madisonian and I doubt very much that any faction in society should wield that kind of power because I doubt that they can do so responsibly. As the current John Roberts court pursues a conservative agenda, it's now liberals pointing out that the judiciary's views represent but a faction of society. And I'm not sure that they are wrong. The current court has carved out for itself the role as a kind of super legislature once again. To summarize, it would be wonderful if the judiciary embodied, embodied the Hamiltonian idea of a natural aristocracy. Oftentimes it has. You can look at the tenure of Chief Justice John Marshall. You can look at Brown versus Board of Education. There's all sorts of moments. But history has also been replete with moments of a, of a factional court using the power of judicial review to effectively write laws that impose one set of values on the rest of us. In those cases, the court usually represents the prejudices of the legal profession, whatever side the legal profession might be on at the time. The constitutional process by which the political branches enact laws is supposed to reflect all the major interests of society while keeping any from becoming hegemonic. Unfortunately, factions can and have taken control of the court under the guise of interpreting the Constitution. I want to make one more point here, sort of an addendum. One of the challenges I think that we have in a, cons in a liberal republic, a liberal republic that represents rights in a, a liberal government where, where protects our rights and a republic is one in which the people rule. The question is, where do our rights come from? If that's How are they discovered? There is a sense, I think, among some that they're promulgated from pure logic and reasoning. We can sort of get a sense of this from Thomas Jefferson's famous elocution in the Declaration of Independence that the, the, our rights are self-evident. 
right? That they're almost divinely ordained, like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai. This is exactly, I think, the sort of thinking about our rights that empowers the Supreme Court. Here, here these are our nine modern Moseses to tell us what our rights are, dressed in black in a temple of marble sitting above all of us. But is that really how our rights are articulated and understood in a republic in which the people are supposed to rule? I find it very ironic that so often we think about that. We think about the First Amendment as being some sort of mosaic law, but it was in fact enacted by the people. It was proposed by the Congress and ratified by the state legislatures. It seems to me that in a republic, the nature and scope of our rights, like everything else, should be the product of public deliberation, ultimately. And while I celebrate Dobbs, I reject the idea that the court has the constitutional or moral authority to tell us what our rights are or what they aren't. In a republic, that task belongs properly to the people through a well-regulated system of popular sovereignty, which the Constitution gives us, but which too often the court has denied us the right to use. Thank you very much. Admittedly, hypothetical questions can be dangerous, but if you would permit me the use of those two feared words, what if? Okay. Uh, what if John Jay had not resigned or retired so early, uh, giving the job to John Marshall? Uh, do you think we would have a very different nation today? I don't know. <laughs> that's the problem with hypothetical. When you ask a hypothetical question that's embedded, like if you ask hypothetically what would have happened if I got a flat tire on my way here, I could say, well, I wouldn't be standing here right now because that's recent. But when you ask a hypothetical question about an event so far back in time, I, I, the answer is I don't know. I will say, though, that I think that your question really does get to the political brilliance of John Marshall in many, many respects. Um, and so would, would John Jay have had the foresight to make that kind of a ruling? I, I don't know. It's a good question, though. And it does, I think, speak to an interesting quality of history is that so often we, we think of history as the product of these impersonal forces. And it is. But at other times, you, you just have to look in it and just be astonished at the extent to which in certain moments, you know, certain the actions, the choices that certain people made swung decisively in one way or another. Like, like, like for instance, what if in 1860 the Republican Party had nominated Simon Cameron instead of Abraham Lincoln? Like, that's sort of like you can't. It's hard to conceive of the North winning the Civil War despite all of its economic advantages without the political um, uh, genius that was Abraham Lincoln. Dr. Koss, thank you. I, I'm afraid I might have missed something, so if this question is uh, nonsensical, just try to make me look as good as possible. Okay. <laughs> the, fact that, the fact that the court put this back to the states, if you will, is that not somewhat of a Madisonian move? I mean, are they not in one sense maybe self-regulating and saying, we are not going to. We are not going to make this decision. We're going to push it back to the states. Yeah. No. I. I. Th I. I agree with that. I definitely think that that's true. And I think that insofar as the court, insofar as the court refuses to to be heavy handed on things, I. I, I celebrate. So I, w I. And I would say also more generally, I, I. I'm not in favor of stare decisis if it. It, you know, a sort of like bad old opinions should be, you know, like if the court seizes power in an act of constitutional aggression, which it did in Roe, the court cannot just blush later on and say, well, stare decisis pro prohibits us from doing anything. Now, you stole something, give, you know, if I stole something 10 years ago from you and you figured out that I stole it from you, came and asked for me, I, wh what would you think of me if I said, well, I can't, it's been 10 years, I can't give this back. You'd think, you're a thief, give it back. So yes, I agree with you. <laughs> 
It was mentioned in an earlier lecture that um, as this whole real, uh, case was surfacing that a lot of the judicial review involved purely oral arguments. There really wasn't much, if any, evidence presented, um, which I think is consistent with what you're saying about factionalism. But can you expand on that at all? I mean, the, the whole judicial review process, it just it baffles me that oral arguments would be, would be presented with, without any evidence. Is that common? Well, it depends. I mean, I, I think oftentimes oral arguments are oral arguments are very staged, and it's sort of the last step along the way. Really, more the the actual evidence gets per, offered in the briefs of the two parties and the amicus briefs. But I, I would I, I want to key off your comment here and say that insofar as the court is evaluating scientific evidence. Ask our our judges who, who what are, what is a judge's background? Is a judge a social scientist? Is they are are they physical sci scientists? Are they chemists? No, they're lawyers. Do that? Do, does their academic background? Does their professional background make them uniquely qualified to consider empirical evidence? I would say the answer is no. And likewise, I would say our judges, by virtue of their background, do they? possess any special knowledge about the nature and scope of liberty. Is that something that they acquire in law school that cannot be acquired anywhere else? Again, I would say the answer is no. So in my in my mind, many, many, the, there's an, a, an arrogance in the presumption of judicial review that the legal prof profession as a profession has the capacity to answer the sorts of questions it claims to answer. Um, Justice Scalia uh, believed that the Constitution was intended to be difficult to change so that and so that the originalists be believed that the that the Constitution was was uh, under grid by eternal moral precepts and there's a lot of folks if that are activist judges or justices that just blow with the wind. So they don't regard the Constitution as anything sacred. So I think that the those and want a living Constitution, they just think, well, what's sacred about the Constitution? Well, if they have no belief in God, if they have no belief in any, that any moral precepts are eternal, but are just whatever the culture votes it is. In fact, even one justice on the Supreme Court can swing a whole vote, five mm -hmm. to four. Absolutely. So I think that that the danger that the, that people that are originalists, the justices, which is why folks that are more conservative want originalists on the Supreme Court and not a activist judges that believe in a living constitution, because then anything goes. Yeah, I, and, and look, I think something to bear in mind as well um, is, is that when we talk about the Constitution and the moral precepts guiding the Constitution, I think we have to be very careful in, in our understanding of things because, um, you know, if you look at the Bill of Rights, for instance, there is a moral vision of humanity embedded in the Bill of Rights. I would agree with that. But the, if you look at the if you look at the main Constitution, the one that was finished on September 17th, 1787, it is not an especially, it's, it's not a document that's loaded, in my opinion, that's loaded with moral claims. It's really more... It's a more more of a Republican document that stipulates the legitimacy of popular sovereignty and then seeks to find a way to manage popular sovereignty, I would say. And I think one of the challenges and one of the reasons why judicial review ends up being such a problem is because the, con the writers of the Constitution did not put in a mechanism, a formal mechanism within it for arbitrating disputes under the Constitution. But if you look at the if you look at the draft that they that they submitted on September seventeenth, there really would have been very little need to. There was no Bill of Rights in that document. There was no Bill of Rights. There was a mini Bill of Rights in Article One, Section Nine. But many of many of those laws were would be self effectuating, like no ex post facto laws, no bills of attainder. It was only later on. It's this great irony is that I, I quoted Brutus, this anti Federalist writer who was worried about the courts. This is great irony embedded within the ratification process, which is that the anti-federalists were very, very worried about the power of the courts. They were also very worried about the absence of a Bill of Rights. So as a compromise, 
supporters of the Constitution agreed to a Bill of Rights, which then has become the domain of the courts. And I think the anti-federalists would be appalled by that today. And I think in some respects, this is why if you go back and you read the anti-federalists, you can see they were on to many things. We only have time for one more question. So I I saw a lot of hands up front that I just haven't got to yet. So I'm going to take someone from up here. So many hands. I love it. Um, so I, I just had a question. I guess I was a little confused at the end of your speech or your talk there. You're talking about the question of where our rights come from and said that, or if I'm understanding, were you arguing that our right, the rights that we have are discussed and agreed to by society or that what we choose to put into laws are protected rights are what? Yeah, that's society, a good... Because I know the Declaration refers to rights as coming from God. Right. what they held to be self-evident. It's not so much where our rights come from that I think is, because I would agree with the basic ideas embedded in the Declaration of Independence, although I think Jefferson's vision in that is a little more, is too too much deism, deism for my taste. Um, I don't think Jefferson actually uses the word God in, I think he uses the word creator instead because Jefferson was not a Christian. Um, it's not so much the question of whether or not, I'm not arguing that the government is the creator of our rights. I'm not arguing anything like that. It's not so much, it's not a question of where our rights come from. It is rather better put, how are the existence of our rights and their specific applications and circumstances, how are those questions answered? What is the best way to answer those questions? Like, it's one thing to say that we have individual rights. It's, it's, it's another thing to say, well, what are those rights? Or more importantly, how do we come about an agreement as a political society about what those rights are? Because there are going to be disagreements about that, right? We see that with Roe versus Wade, right? There is, at, on both sides of Roe versus Wade, believe in the existence of individual rights. There's a dispute though over what those rights require of us and the question becomes how are those disputes resolved and I think the Madisonian argument or at least what I take to be the Madisonian argument is that those disputes are properly resolved through a robust political process in which the people are ultimately sovereign and I, like I said as an example of that is that we often take the, the First Amendment as having been delivered on high from on high by Moses but in fact it was was written by James Madison. It was based on his extensive read of the Anglo-American legal tradition. It was approved by both chambers of Congress, and it was ratified by the state legislatures. In other words, the First Amendment was not written by God. It was written by us. And, and that, I think, is it, my argument is, is that the proper way for us to understand our rights is not by handing it off to this group that sits outside of the political community, but through the political community itself. And at the very least, if we are going to hand it to somebody outside of the political community, the last group of people we should hand it off to are the lawyers. LAUGHTER